All right, here's lesson 8.1, our first unit for the Great Depression. Causes and effects of the Great uh, Depression are effect, uh, effectively important here. And uh, the independent work and a little bit of our summary here will be also on how President Hoover responds to it, the last of the Republican presidents in the 1920s. America has stand, uh, enjoys a very high standard of living, but in this picture, of course, we can see a great contrast here that develops in the Great Depression and in particular here, a contrast for minorities who suffer a bit more significantly than the common average person. 1928 election uh, is significant in that Mr. Coolidge decides not to run. He could have run again. Uh, the country was going crazy on buying stocks. Those who uh, have money are buying stocks. But the stock market uh, dropped uh, very significantly in a few short periods in 1927. And Mr. Coolidge uh, really kind of sees maybe that the end is uh, what's coming is maybe not such a great thing, a depression is coming. But the stocks rose again, and that mindset that everything is good and the sky is the limit really kind of returns to things. I'm out of here, I need some naps. 1928, the Republicans choose instead uh, our new candidate here, and that is Herbert Hoover, the Hooverizer from World War I. Uh, really a rags to riches kind of a story from Iowa, orphan. Uh, IQ of a genius, a wealthy businessman and engineer, and of course, very significant in the uh, coordination of the United States Food Administration during World War I, helping feed Europe and organize the food conservation effort. Uh, so he's a household name. Uh, he's uh, the head of this rationing during World War I, as we can kind of see here. Uh, and Americans love this guy uh, because of that and have him as a very well-known person. Uh, very much again here, we've got women in the 1920s voting for the first time. Uh, one of the phrases and the catchphrases for his campaign in 1928 is a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. And uh, we'll see in 1932, the Democrats will kind of lambast him for that. That'll be his second attempt for the presidency and in the depths of the Great Depression, it's not gonna pan out so well for him. But we're gonna get right to his opposition. His opposition for the Democratic Party is Alfred E. Smith, champion of the poor, a governor from New York, had a really strong, thick accent, which didn't necessarily uh, mesh with, and, and I, other Americans didn't commonly identify with uh, so much. He's also a Roman Catholic, uh, the first Roman Catholic nominee for president, and being a Protestant nation, this is a bit of a problem for most Americans platform, anti-prohibition, it's not working, we need more efficient government, kind of a mindset of progressivism, you might say here a little bit, and uh, the result of this election is going to be very bad for him. His Catholicism really kind of stands out in that people are afraid that a president who is Catholic may somehow in some way be connected to the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope controlling him. And you can kind of see that here in this particular uh, placard here promoted by in a meeting of the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan, you need to think Protestant, White Anglo-Saxon Protestant as well. They're not a fan of Alfred E. Smith, and of course he's a northerner. Klan is in the south. They have significant influence. Uh, but oddly enough, the Democratic South and Smith uh, carries the Democratic South, the solid South here, and the rest of the country goes with Mr. Hoover, Hoover eyes in the 1928 election. Clearly a landslide. Problems for him, drought in the 1930s. Drought damage, we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's all kinds of problems in terms of business, business depression. We have the Democratic donkey in the background here chanting and praying back and forth. Uh, the Democratic National Convention Committee, you can see here all the old familiar songs here. Taint gonna rain no more, which references the drought in the 1930s, it's gonna start. Uh, which is very significantly bad. We'll talk about that in terms of the Dust Bowl and uh, the good old times ain't what they used to be. The 20s are gone. Nobody knows how dry I am. This doesn't refer to the drought. This refers to the country being dry, prohibition, and this is going to be an issue coming up. October 3rd, 1929, just weeks after he is, or months after he is inaugurated into the presidency, uh, we have three straight days of stock prices plunging, investors panic. They've got to get their money back because there's a big trend of buying uh, stocks on margin, taking out loans to buy stock. Uh, they've got to pay it off, and so people sell kind of a panic mode that drives down demand for stocks, drives down prices for stocks, and you have this big plummeting effect. October 24th, Black Thursday, traders sold 13 million shares. Uh, and then on October 29th, 
Black Tuesday, the panic continues. Over 16 million shares sold. The New York Stock Exchange closes to try and prevent further panic, and the great crash has happened. The depression does not happen on that day, though. What this is, the stock market crash, is a symptom of what is wrong or that something is wrong in the economy. It's a symptom of the country being sick. It's not necessarily the virus. Six months later is when this severe economic crisis really hits. People start losing their jobs, uh, getting laid off. Uh, production starts to slow down. Economic output is cut in half. Uh, the stock market crash does not, does not cause it. Again, it's a symptom. We're going to get into the causes. Important to look at our timeline and time frame here. Here's where it, uh, it, what it looks like in terms of unemployment. 1929, 3.3% before the crash. Unemployed, really good number. Uh, I think we're probably in the high in the eights or the sevens here at this point, and it's going to reach a high point of 24, uh, maybe up into 30, 32, 33 at some points. So you see different statistics some in different places. Um, this is nationally in some places, uh, some cities, some locales and locations in the country. You have way higher unemployment rates. 1933 is where we're going to see Mr. Uh, Roosevelt come into power, and we'll see that. With Roosevelt coming into power, there will be an impact on unemployment. People will get put to work, so unemployment's going to go down. But in his second term in office, we're going to see that it's going to kind of go back up again. The thing and the, that's very important in all this, looking ahead, is that what's going to get us out of the Depression is World War II. The New Deal is not going to get us out of the Depression. It's going to provide us some relief. It's going to provide us and basically be the aspirin that is going to help alleviate the pain that we feel and the symptoms that we feel, the sweats, the cold shakes, the aches, uh, that kind of thing. All right. So Hoover's response to the test to the Great Depression, this is just temporary. It's going to go away. This is a natural cycle of things. Laissez-faire is the theme. We'll come out of it. Uh, in the meantime, state and local government uh, officials, local community members need to be the ones to provide relief and aid for the needy. They can be the most responsive to people in a particular area, charity groups, churches, neighbors. Uh, this is basically called associationism. Uh, it's not the federal government's responsibility and job to take care of individual people. It needs to be done on a local level. That's where the re responsive, efficient response to stress and maybe even disorder can really happen. Uh, some states, though, ran out of aid money. Aid money was giving out. Uh, and assistance was given out state to state in varying different levels, but when the states ran out of money, that's it. There was nothing else, and it came down to neighbors, but neighbors often had very little, and if your neighbor didn't have anything to give, then you couldn't go to your neighbor. Uh, the problem was just too deep and too vast for common people to help each other out. Everybody was poor. Al Capone actually gets a very good name for himself during this time period, set up multiple food kitchens uh, throughout his little system of things and uh, became kind of a hero of the people in that sense as well. Uh, and it's uh, at some point though that Hoover as a Republican is a bit more liberal than other Republicans. He does see some need to take some action and uh, he's not quite as conservative. But the question will be, is it enough? And will we see maybe this kind of action taken to a different level with FDR? The answer will be yes. But he attempts some relief. In 1930, 30, the Holly Smoot tariff uh, was raised to try and protect U.S. jobs and uh, keep Americans in jobs, protect from foreign uh, competition. But that's going to fail. Other countries are going to tax our goods. So the result is, if you want to add it down here, it's important to maybe note, the result is that we're not going to sell to other countries. Thus, less economic transactions are happening. This is not good for American jobs either. So this is probably the opposite of what we really should do. And we'll see that when we get to our Democrat, FDR, he is going to do the opposite. He's going to try to get rid of those tariffs. Other attempts at relief, 1931, he puts a moratorium or a halt, key word for your, in your notebook on repaying the international debt, the Dawes plan, and that whole plan and loaning of money to Germany so that the Allies and the reparation repair them repayments can go on is paused and put on hold, uh, conserving American money to try and help out here. In 1933, they create the Reconstruction Refinance Corporation. We'll see that this lasts for quite a while, even under President Roosevelt. Uh, and the idea was here that we're going to give money and loans to key businesses and industries. Who they were were railroads, banks, life insurance companies. But the problem was is that it was too little of a focus too small an area and it was at the wrong end of the system. It was at the top. 
the people and massive numbers of people are suffering here. One particular thing that he does start that will be taken to a completely different level by FDR is public works programs. And the best example of that is the Hoover Dam. Now, if you think about where it is, out, on the, out, out east, or excuse me, out west, uh, out in Nevada, Colorado River, uh, this thing is going to generate lots of jobs for a good number of years. It's still operation. It's going to bring electricity, in, which is a maintenance of jobs over a good number of years. But does this help the whole country? No. It only helps just that particular area. And so what we're going to see with the New Deal is a lot of these programs spread throughout the country and basically kind of customized for particular areas of the country uh, to fit their needs to try and get economic activity going on again. Uh, one thing that's important to take a look at here also is some social events that are happening uh, during this time. During the 1920s or uh, 1920s, uh, World War I uh, uh, veterans uh, and after World War I, veterans of World War I were pa promised uh, a bonus uh, by the year 1945 from the United States government. But when the Depression hit, these people were desperate for money and they needed money now. And so what developed was basically a march of former World War I veterans uh, into Washington, D.C., setting up camp and protesting in front of Congress, uh, in front of the Capitol and the White House uh, to get their money early. Why would we wait? We'll be dead if we don't have our money now. I'm going to post this link so you can watch it. Uh, uh, if you type in bonus army, it does a good job of portraying what happens here. But basically Hoover's response is, and the government's response is, we will never ever allow this to happen. If we have people marching on uh, the government for money now and we give it to them now, we're going to have to give more people money later somehow, some way. We're going to set a bad precedent. General Douglas MacArthur and Eisenhower, his aide, uh, are sent in with the United States military to burn the camps down. Uh, it gets violent. Uh, it gets put on TV, uh, on uh, the nation's, in the nation's newspapers and media. It's seen in film, uh, in theaters, not TV at this point in time, but it's seen in theaters and little newscasts that happen before the main show. Uh, and basically Hoover is claiming in, that they are challenging the authority of the government and what the common average American saw was that this was an attack on their own people, on common people, especially war veterans and it looked bad, very discrediting for him and the Republican Party, and it's going to very much hurt in the coming coming uh, election in 1932. Pay attention to, make sure you watch that bonus army clip. Uh, causes of the Great Depression. Number one, dark stock market rules, there were none, zero. Lying on the value of stocks uh, was common, it was rampant. Companies would say that uh, in their and their accounting books that they're making this amount of money and they're buying and selling this amount of goods uh, and that kind of thing and they would inflate the price of their stock and basically lie to their investors and they we have this trend of people buying these stocks on margin uh, a little bit down borrowing the rest of course putting up collateral or their possessions their homes uh, in case they don't get their money back and this causes stock market prices to be overinflated and to skyrocket and they're using this money for research and development and to make more things, make more produce, more goods, but people can't eventually at some point here in, by 1929 buy all those goods and we'll see why in just a second. And so basically and unethical dealings in the stock market is a major factor here. The second cause is uneven distribution of income. We have underconsumption of goods. We were in a consumer economy in the 1920s, but pretty soon people max out the installment buying is what you're going to want to maybe jot down here as a fit to this topic. Kills off, I guess it is right there, kills off people's eventually ability to pay back. And they were encouraged and promoted, buy more, buy more, buy more, but wages don't keep up and pretty soon purchasing stops. But businesses and industry keep purchasing, or keep, excuse me, keep buying and or producing and producing and producing, and it just hits a wall, all right? And again, we see here now that the common person again Key emphasis is that uh, you know only a really small portion of the population, one percent of the people, had about a third of all the money in the country at that time. And so money wasn't being put into an increase in pay; it was being put into production. Uh, and the price of goods was increasing because of this false demand, because of of installment buying, um, and uh, people eventually buy less. There's no money to repay it back, and this is a problem. The trickle-down effect is a concept here that really has been at work for a while uh, from the conservative side of things and that 
you know, from what we've talked about from the Civil War and early in our American history, we have high tariffs on foreign goods to protect American businesses. There's little regulation. There's laissez-faire. Uh, we cut taxes to try and get spending going. Uh, this is supposed to increase business profit and money is supposed to trickle down to the people in the form of jobs and it's supposed to go around and around. When people get those jobs, they spend money, they buy, buy, and it's supposed to circulate around and around like this. But the problem is, is that there are barriers to that circulation that were being developed and occurring, right? And every time money was spent, it wasn't coming back down to the people. We have increased business profit, good prices, uh, in price, uh, prices of goods are increasing, uh, you know, business and, businesses and, and uh, unions, if you remember here at this point in time, uh, are at odds with each other and unions aren't promoted. Pay increases aren't fitting. Uh, pay wages uh, kind of plateaus or flattens after World War I. If you remember the strikes right after World War I, uh, there's no minimum wage at this time. They can pay you whatever you want. Uh, there's no labor union support because they're socialists and communists uh, and uh, the money just goes to the top and it's not coming back down in the form of wages. And people are encouraged to buy on installment plans, creates false demand, a false sense of what people want, uh, and eventually purchases decrease because people are maxed out in their debt. And uh, at the same time, remember, I think we should probably put over on this side as well, that we have that thing called uh, the tariff over here that is also causing a problem with the selling of goods overseas. So make sure you write that down. We're going to talk about that right in a few moments. And so money is floating up, but it's not coming down. Mechanization is another problem. It's me called mechanized uh, unemployment. And basically factories uh, and technology and machines are producing things more and more all the time. And in scientific management, business and industries try to come up with a machine to produce things because they'll run 24-7. They won't complain. They won't get sick. They won't get hurt. They won't get injured. And uh, this increases production. It brings prices down. And of course, that makes more people buy more things. But again, we eventually hit a wall here with this. And eventually, we have, with machines replacing people, we have a consumption dropping because some of those jobs are going away because of machines. And so the spending decreases that way. So that's cause number three, mechanization. And this is happening also in the agricultural world. Cause number four, there's an unbalanced foreign trade. This shows here and reflects here the tariff. Uh, the tariff is established, the Holly Smoot tariff, uh, and other tariffs we've talked about are establishing basically a fortress America in which foreign goods can't come in. There's too much of a price tag on placed on their goods before they're allowed for sale here in the United States. It kills foreign markets. And the problem here is, again, that the United States has been loaning money to foreign countries and foreigners uh, repay this, these loans to United States bankers and industries uh, by selling goods in the United States. But they can't sell goods in the United States uh, because U.S. companies are screaming, no, we don't want the competition. Put a high tariff for tax on it. It hurts our profit. And so we have these high tariffs being placed on. Holly Smoot, again, being one of them. And this shows, this cartoon kind of shows it again here. Uh, the tariff wall, foreigners being shut out of the U.S. market, but at the same time, it puts up a wall, and foreigners put up a wall on our goods as well. It works both ways uh, as a reaction. And U.S. investors aren't getting their loans repaid because foreigners can't repay their loans. This is for the reason for the moratorium on the Dawes plan. Uh, foreigners retaliate with high tariffs on U.S. goods, U.S. profits decrease, inventories rise, companies can't repay their loans that they operate, uh, take out to operate, and banks repossess, companies go bankrupt, banks don't want to repossess because they want their money and their interest back, they don't want to own a possession of farm, a business, so on and so forth, and we have basically a plummeting of world trade that you can see happens here in this depression because of these tariffs. Right? So cause number five, huge farm surplus. Despite the fact that we're an urban society, farming and agriculture is a massive part of, uh, of, the, of the economy at this point in time. And despite the fact that we're an industrialized society, prohibition has kind of shut down one source uh, for farmers and one source of demand for, for, for grain and farm produce. Uh, there's no grain for alcohol being, uh, being utilized. Uh, World War I is done, demand for goods went away. Farm technology, these tractors that were bought during World War I, and farmers tended to continue to buy to grow more crops, to meet up with uh, their, their bills and their mortgages that they took out during World War I, uh, causes that price to continue to plummet and continue to fall. So those are the five causes. It's multiple areas. It's not just one event like the uh, 
uh, stock market crash. It's a symptom. These are the causes. And this is what we start seeing around the country during Hoover's administration. Outside of major cities, people uh, who are homeless, don't have jobs, uh, get kicked out of their homes or out of the place they're renting, finding any piece of scrap lumber in a garbage dump or in, along the river and putting up a ramshackle house. They become known as Hoover, Hoovervilles. Uh, outside of uh, New York City, uh, or in New York City at, in Central Park, this is what they look like. People roam the country all over the place uh, and they're looking for jobs, trying to find an opportunity and many towns get very, very aggressive in keeping outsiders out because there's no opportunity here. We don't want your competition. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's a very, very tough time. And some of the toughest times are really uh, found in our nation's cities. Uh, because in our nation cities, people can't just necessarily grow a crop or grow a garden and support themselves. In, in rural America, that can kind of happen yet. Even though farmers are suffering, uh, it, there's, there's a way to feed yourself in, in many cases yet. Uh, but uh, Hoover and what he does, despite not doing enough, he did advocate direct government involvement more than previous presidents, especially Republican presidents. Right? And so he talks some relief, but the key idea here is that it is in these hard times, uh, not going to be quite enough. And the new president will take it to a completely different level and change our system and society and government involvement in, in the economy uh, and society forever. And so there's really a refusal to go on a large scale relief effort and to reduce misery, to give direct assistance to people. Uh, Hoover vetoed the use of federal funds for relief for the needy, which would have been direct handouts, for example. That's very anti-laissez-faire. But here is a, a kind of a list of the legislation that was established during that time. And uh, you should go ahead and make sure that you detail kind of what it did, uh, who was it supposed to help, what was its real effect, uh, and uh, look at it as a beginning of a sample of some government action uh, that was taken, but idea here is not quite significantly enough at all. We will see very similar things like this with FDR and at a much different level. Good day.